Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 229, featuring the first in a brand new series of interviews with none other than Mr. Stuart Chaffee, the host and producer of Computer Chronicles, only one of the most awesome TV shows in the history of the world, at least if you're a computer nerd, and I have a strong suspicion that is exactly what you are. Anyway, this is utterly fascinating and fantastic stuff. In this first part of the interview, we'll be talking about the history of the show, uh, how Stuart uh, came up with the idea of doing Computer Chronicles, and then we'll hear about uh, the, the sad story, really, of his co-host, Gary Kildall. Anyway, lots of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Stuart Chaffee. Folks, I am here with Stuart Chaffee. He's the uh, host and producers of Computer Chronicles and Net Cafe, uh, shows you've probably heard of if you've been in, uh, interested in the computer game or computer industry as a whole for any period uh, period of time. He's a journalist with over 30 years of experience, and he's probably got thousands upon thousands of great stories uh, to tell about the uh, the era of computer history that we uh, so enjoy. How are you uh, doing today, Stuart? I'm doing pretty well, actually. It's... Uh... Hard to imagine it's been 30 years, as you said. We started Computer Chronicles in 1982. There were, so hardly, really any, were. There were hardly any personal computers yet. And you just had the best possible vantage point to witness the development of this. Well, we were really lucky. I mean, we, we had our show based in the Silicon Valley. We were in San Mateo, California, so all the key people we needed were pretty close. And, uh, yeah, it was a great adventure. I don't know if you know the, the history of the show is kind of interesting, but, you know, when the computers first came out, as I'm sure you know, I mean, the only way to get good information was to belong to a user's group. And, you know, there were no computer magazines at the time, no computer TV shows, no computer information sources, really, uh, except for some Usenet sites. And my idea was actually to why not televise a weekly user's group meeting so that lots of people could participate in this. And that's really how it started as a local show in the Bay Area, televising a users group meeting. And there was so much positive reaction to it, we said, oh, maybe this is a TV show, and then kept on going. And what kind of people were attending these user group meetings? Uh, guys like you, <laughs> guys like me. I mean, we had, we had just bought our little personal computers or our computer kits or whatever it was that we had. And we needed help. I mean, you know, it was complicated 30 years ago. You had to set dip switches and pull out cars and play with boards. And people needed help. How do you get these things to work? What's the coolest thing you just found out? So it was, you know, early adopter geeks. Uh, and it was, it was really great fun. And I thought just the idea to why not share this? And it's interesting, actually. We did this locally for a while. We never even thought about this as a real national TV show. We started this Thursday night, 8 o'clock, as a local show in the Bay Area. And even before the internet and all that stuff, there were still bulletin boards and so on. So guys started talking around the country and these PBS stations started getting phone calls from the hackers in their community saying, well, here's this TV show that explains all this stuff. Why don't you guys carry it? So these TV stations started calling me and said, oh, can we carry this Computer Chronicles thing you're doing? And before we knew it, it was on over 200 stations and all around the world. So you were the, uh, you owned a station or you were the manager no, of the station? No, I, I happened to be the manager of a PBS station in the Bay Area at the time. So luckily I sort of controlled the resources. So if I wanted to do the show, I just did the show. So it was sort of a hobby, really. I mean, I was really running this TV station. And just for fun, we ran this uh, Computer Chronicle show every week. Kind of wondering before we get, you know, more into the history of the show, uh, what have you been doing lately? Well, I'm still doing television. We're actually playing around with pushing a couple new ideas for computer TV shows. I mean, that whole landscape has changed over the last 10 years. I mean, every guy like you can do a TV computer show, basically. So we can't really just do Computer Chronicles the way we used to do it. Though I don't think anybody has ever quite emulated what we did then. Uh, so we're looking now for sort of niche shows right now, maybe a show for kids, maybe a show for senior citizens. Uh, we're talking about a show possibly focusing on women in computing. And I do other television stuff. I'm just finishing up a special for PBS now, actually, on music for the piano. Uh, I just did a series for Fox Business Channel on 
uh, Palm Oil in Malaysia. So I still do a lot of television stuff. Um, <clears throat> but needed a, needed a break for a while after having done Computer Chronicles for 20 years. You're also a professor of journalism? I was a professor of journalism. Yeah, for four years I was teaching uh, broadcast journalism at the Reynolds School of Journalism at the University of Nevada. I, st I stopped that last year. What do you think about all these uh, YouTube channels uh, covering the same coverage? You, you look at this and sort of cringe and think, oh, these guys need more journalism uh, training. I mean, what, what, what would be your advice for somebody that would like to do the, the kind of work you do? Well, I mean... I mean, take your class, I guess, but, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that, that's a tough one because, I mean, to do the show the, we, the way we did, it takes a lot of resources. I mean, we were flying in people from all over the country. We had a big proper studio. I mean, it was a, you know, big time professional television operation with, you know, we had about 10 people working, 10, 12 people working on the show just behind the scenes. So it was, it was a different level of operation. I mean, we didn't have the option of doing Skype and YouTube uh, 30 years ago. Uh, I think for, I mean, there, you know, there are probably hundreds of computer chronicles lookalikes right now that are on, on the web. Uh, and for what they are for basically zero budget and using the tools you have, I mean, they're interesting. Uh, <clears throat> the advice would be you need more money, I think, to really produce a, a network quality, quality show. I, I don't think the journalism is lacking necessarily. Uh, and the other thing, the difference is time. I mean, when you're on television, you have very limited time restraints. You know, we had 28 minutes and 30 seconds to do a show. So it was boom, boom, boom. The pace really had to be quick. Uh, now on the web, I mean, there's no clock. Basically, you go as long as you want. You do whatever you want. So a different mentality. That's, in a way, created a certain laziness, I think, because there is, no, there is not that pressure. You can just, you know, go on for an hour and a half if you want. So you don't have to edit yourself quite as much as we used to do on television. Yeah, you know, this my understanding the show was filmed live uh, on what tape. We, what we call live on tape, yeah. yeah. What exactly uh, does that mean? Uh, it was live in that we started at the beginning and we went to the end. And the only time we redid something is if, as often happened, a demo crashed and things didn't work right. I mean, we were dealing with cutting-edge stuff and uh, sometimes, especially some of the other, you know, the challenging technologies, uh, artificial intelligence stuff, voice recognition uh, things never worked. Even a lot of the gaming stuff, I mean, didn't work for the first time around. So if we really blew a demonstration so that we couldn't really present it to the audience, we would stop and do it again. But basically, we, we would shoot every other Saturday to two shows in a row, and we allocated four hours for each half-hour show. But if all went well, I mean, we'd shoot the show in, in an hour. So Mostly it was, it was live unless there was a disaster, and there were many disasters. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. I'll tell been. you, know, one other interesting point is the disasters tended to come when we had CEOs on the show. If we, <laughs> if we had the geek behind the scenes that had developed something, he knew how to do it. But, you know, if we had some ego CEO want to go, oh, let me show you my product and have to, how do I do this? You know, what button do I press? <laughs> That's what so we simple, have. simple, even a CEO can do it. Huh? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Must have been some, eth you know, some ethical calls you had to make between showing this thing uh, failing. You know, and then uh, letting them go back and do it again. I mean, how did you decide that? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I mean, if something had failed, we would I would try to point that out. Uh, but I mean, there was no point in wasting our twenty eight minutes with showing things crashing. We just couldn't afford to do that. Uh, but if we had a if something didn't work, I mean, we would say it didn't work. Usually these usually they didn't work because there were just like we had audio problems setting up Skype before. You know, somebody forgot a, a particular setting. Somebody forgot to throw some particular switch or something. So it was usually a setup issue, not that the stuff didn't work. I mean, if the stuff didn't work, we wouldn't have it on the show. What we tried to do basically is, you know, you had a thousand choices of every product out there. So we had a staff who would do the research and spend time looking at, you know, 20 versions of some particular product and say, these are about the four or five best ones we found right now. Let's put those on the show and show that to our viewers. So it was, it was pretty selective stuff. So how did you meet Jim Warren? Uh, well, that's interesting. Of course, you remember the West Coast Computer Fair. That's what really Jim started the very first computer show. Uh, and I'm trying to remember exactly how that came about. I probably met him at the West Coast Computer Fair. And we got to talking about wanting to do this sort of live users group meeting. And Jim was a mover and shaker at the time. And actually, Jim was the original host when it was a local show. Jim was the original host of the show. So we met and talked about it. And 
he, you know, he knew all the guys in the Silicon Valley that were playing around with all this stuff. So uh, it was probably through the West Coast Computer Fair and our common interest in kind of spreading the good word about what was going on. And those episodes with him are, are lost. I'm afraid so. They might possibly exist. I mean, they were taped, but uh, I don't think the TV station has those anymore, I'm afraid. People ask me about that all the time. And we, we never thought we were doing anything important, frankly, when we started. Who the hell would want to watch this stuff a couple of years later, you know? Uh, so, yeah, we never really paid attention to that, that first local series. When we got to the national series the year after that, I mean, we had to record them because we were distributing to the network. And so we do have all – I still have every one of those tapes sitting in a monster library. Yeah, and they're also – I guess they're pretty much all on archive. Uh, most of the shows are on archive.org. Uh, a lot of the shows, there were some problems in uploading some of those, and I'm still trying to catch up. We have with some shows, you know, the audio is missing or it's not in the sync or whatever. Uh, we're actually right now working on building a new Computer Chronicles website that will do it properly. I mean, archive was a great idea, uh, but we didn't have a lot of control over that since you know, it wasn't my organization. Though I, I did end up working with the archive for a while uh, after we did Chronicles on there and, and that cafe. Um, but yeah, we're trying to actually build a brand new website right now so we have a, a higher quality version. And we get so many calls. I, I can't believe it, frankly. I, I still get emails every day from old people and from kids. I mean, I just got an email yesterday from a 15 year old. Oh, I just discovered that show. That's the coolest stuff. I, I find it hard to believe that a 15 year old kid finds this interesting what they do and of course you know the old guys who've been around forever find it interesting too it still gets downloaded you know hundreds of thousands of times on archive yeah it's a really awesome historical resource it's it really you know, fascinating is. for me to think 50 years from now or maybe even 100 years from yeah. now, people going back and looking at that you know it's, it's a it's such a great resource to have all that from that era i try to think what, what if we had something like this or the right. equivalent of this for film history right, right, or right. It, yeah, pretty is, it's pretty unique, really. I mean, we have the only video history of the PC revolution, basically, for the first 20 years. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm thrilled in retrospect that we did it. We, ne we never thought this was going to be important, frankly, as I told you. We thought this was some stupid little thing that a couple people would pay attention to. So it seems like that seemed to be the attitude at the time. This, this would never work. Uh, who exactly. cares about this stuff? I mean, why? why? It seems like... You know, they didn't recognize that computers were going to be a, a really big thing. Well, you remember some of the great, you know, the guys, I forget the guy's name, the guy with, that was with uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, and they were making minis. And I forget the guy, somebody worked with him and said, we should do, do this personal computer thing. He said, why would anybody want a computer in their house? What are they going to do with it, you know? So, no, nobody ever imagined that, you know, we'd be walking around with our little smartphones right now, computer in our pocket. How did you meet Gary Kildall? Well, Gary's, Gary's an interesting story. We were looking, actually, we started out looking for uh, a sponsor for the show. And, of course, da uh, Gary was running digital research at the time, DRI, um, down in Monterey, near, near the Bay Area. And we originally approached Gary to see if he would be willing to give us the money to fund this show we were doing. And as we got to talking to Gary about it, uh, he, we saw he was really smart guy. He was really interested in what we were trying to do. And I thought that'd be really fun to have Gary on the show. I said, Gary, would you be interested in co-hosting the show? He said, yeah, absolutely. And so what happened really starting out looking at DRI as a, and they were actually one of our original, uh, uh, underwriters for the show. And then we ended up getting luckily Gary on the show and Gary was so committed, you know, he lived it was over 100 miles away. Gary would drive up to, up to San Mateo, California every other Saturday uh, to be on this show. I mean, he was, he was a phenomenal guy, phenomenal guy. And, uh, yeah, it, made, made, it was just one of the thrills of my life was, was knowing him and working with him. Uh, you know, there's a lot of jerks in the computer business, especially on the business side. Gary was a gentleman, absolute pure gentleman. And it, was, it hurt him in a way, being a gentleman. Yeah, I want to get more into that, but I just want to say I thought that was a – you were t I saw another interview where you're talking about this uh, relationship, you know, the way that worked, the dynamic, yeah. the way you worked with Gary on the show. So he was sort mm -hmm. of the, the really technically right. knowledgeable uh, super geek, I guess, and you right. were the, the translator. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, that was the theory. I mean, we needed, 
I mean, frankly, that's one of the problems we had way back with the Jim Warren version of the show. I mean, Jim was the super geek, but didn't have some of the uh, skills it took to really run a television show. Uh, Gary was the super geek. I sort of knew the television on air business, and we figured as a team that would be perfect combination. And uh, I think it worked out. We had, you know, Gary did the show for something like the first 10 years, I guess. All right, so, so about Gary being a decent guy. Yeah. <laughs> now, can you elaborate a bit on this? I mean, what? what well, what, what, he, the, the jerks in the industry, what do they jerk like about? I mean, what, what are they after? Uh, they, well, the, I mean, the classic line, you know, in the Silicon Valley is, you know, we're, we're going to make the world a better place, when what they really mean is we want to make a lot of money for ourselves. Gary really did want to make the world a better place. I mean, Gary became very wealthy, uh, even though he never you know, even screwed up the IBM MS DOS deal, uh, you know he's a very successful guy. Uh, but Gary was a not a businessman. Inside, he was just a geek. I mean, he loved software, he loved coding, he loved programming, uh, he loved the challenge of figuring out how to solve problems. And that was not necessarily the same skill set you needed to be successful in this booming software computer business. Uh, and you know, you know the famous story about him and IBM and Bill Gates and MS DOS and all that stuff and IBM. Uh, I was hoping you could tell that story because I've heard different versions of what happened. Uh, well, there's one version, and uh, Gary. Let's see, it's a complicated story. We I, we actually, I don't know if you ever saw, we did a half hour show on Gary after he died, and that really has the best version of the story. That's up on archive. Uh, Gary was a. When I say he was a decent guy, the day he was supposed to meet with the IBM representative was his wife's birthday. He had promised, and Gary was a pilot, and Gary had promised his wife that on her birthday he would take her up flying. And the IBM called and said, guy called and said, we're going to come in on Saturday to have this meeting. He said, I'm sorry, I can't do it on Saturday. I promised my wife that I'd take her flying. It's her birthday. Let's do it next week. And that was the beginning of the problem. Uh, and... That sort of ended up with the screwed up deal with, with um, they're making the deal with Gates to get MS DOS, which didn't, hadn't really even written yet. And, and Gary was trying to pitch his, his uh, CPM as the operating system for the IBM PC. But it was, it was a classic example of Dar Gary being decent and being a little bit naive when they did negotiate eventually a deal. He did come back, and as you may know the story, IBM licensed, in fact, MS DOS and CPM. But the contract was such that IBM had the right to choose one of them. So Gary thought he had a deal with IBM, but the IBM lawyers were very clever. And while they had a deal, they had no commitment to use CPM, and they chose to use MS-DOS instead. So it, yeah. it, it, it wasn't it, Gates trying to screw him over there. No, it really wasn't Gates. I mean, Gates was very, very clever as a business guy, obviously. And as I say, they basically sold IBM something they didn't even have yet. I mean, Gary did have an operating system, uh, but Gates was a better salesman, um, and Gary lost the, and it, it literally ruined Gary's life. I mean, he never overcame that frustration at sort of becoming second to, to Microsoft and Bill Gates, and to some degree that led to his early death. Yeah, I heard you say that it, this whole thing basically killed him, and I mean, he must have taken this really, really hard. He took it very, very hard. And I can tell you, I mean, even when he was co-hosting the show, any time we were going to show something that had to do with Microsoft or IBM, he, let me show you my version of this. You know, and, and, you know, I don't know if you remember Jim, which is his graphical environment, graphical environment, I forget what Jim stood for, graphic environmental manager. Manage maybe. Yeah, manager, that's right. Uh, so, I mean, Gary was ahead of the curve in many, many of these things, but he just, he didn't know how to sell it well enough. Uh, so he was, he was, yeah, I mean, if we were going to show something that competed with something he was currently doing at DRI, uh, he said, I got to show you my version of this because he was very proud of what he had done. Um, and yeah, it sort of ate away at him really. And he eventually started gaining weight. He got divorced. He started drinking. And I don't know if you know the story about how he died, but he was at a bar in Monterey and got into a fight. And some guy hit him, and his head hit the concrete, and Gary was killed. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. Uh... And again, it just it was the saddest, saddest thing because what a nice guy, what a, what a decent guy. 
but yeah, it's just impossible for me to picture the you know that scene. But yeah, I mean, just in your opinion, do you think that his uh, operating system was better? I don't think it was better, but it was certainly first, and it was real, which you couldn't say for MS DOS at the time. And also, Gary, I mean, Gary was up there really ahead of the Macintosh. I mean, Gary really had a GUI, a graphical user interface with Gem. Uh, <clears throat> so he had a lot of frustrations. It, it kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, the old Betamax VHS battle. You know, Betamax was a superior technology, but Panasonic and VHS were better businessmen. And so the, the weaker technology won out. I mean, you know, I don't know what would have happened. Obviously, the world became a Windows world and so on. But yeah, it literally killed Gary. Yeah, it sounds similar to the story. Of, it seems like we <coughs> both have a, a bit of a soft spot for the Commodore oh, Amiga yeah. platform. It must have been. <laughs> I remember watching Computer Chronicles back in the <laughs> 90s and just yeah. hating this. You could see it just right. losing every day is a little bit more obscure. Yeah, yeah. Well, Gary worked very closely with Jack Tramiel at Commodore, of course. Uh, so he was... Yeah, I mean, that was sort of more and more his platform. I and mean, he, he kind of liked some of the innovative things that were going on with the Amiga. And Gary, I don't know if many people know this, was, was the, an innovator in, in, in digital, uh, digital uh, recordings. Gary actually produced the very first digital laser encyclopedia. I still have a copy of it. It's a laser disc, one of these monster things. But he had the entire Grolier's encyclopedia on a laser disc. It was the first digital encyclopedia. And, and again, he just he wasn't successful at getting the word out about what he was doing. He was very big in, in, into the you know, uh, optical stuff. And uh, it's one of my precious possessions. This is the old, original encyclopedia on, a, on a, uh, these monster CDs. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And if you didn't, I apologize. Don't really know what planet you're from. Uh, we've got a lot of great stuff in this interview series. I mean, we are just barely scratched the surface of this stuff. So uh, stay tuned. There'll be much more Stuart Chaffee in the weeks to come. As always, I want to thank you very, very much. If you have supported my show, Matt Chat, uh, remember, guys, there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, the easiest, in my opinion, best and most fun way is to go to patreon.com. Just look for the link in the show notes, and you can join the community of people just like yourself who are not only uh, participating uh, monetarily, but helping me with suggestions and comments and feedback. You know, it's, it's, all, a great, it's all great stuff. Uh, we're built a great community around this program, and people just like you. So thank you very much for your continued support. Now, what about that ale of the week? Well... So for the L this week, I've got a Surly Brewing Company a selection called Overrated, the West Coast Style IPA. It's in a, a can, but supposedly the uh, beer for a glass from a can is their logo or their motto. So hopefully we'll see how that works out. Uh, it says, it's been said, it's easier to brew an extremely hoppy beer than an extremely balanced beer. And you know us, we're always looking for the easy way out, so we jumped on the West Coast IPA bandwagon and brewed this dry and hoppy ale. Uh, so these guys have a great sense of humor. Uh, they're actually out of Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Not really sure how far that is from St. Cloud, but uh, these beers are getting very popular. A lot of the stores around here are advertising them on their, on their billboards. But anyway, let's get this overrated open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this uh, overrated West Coast IPA here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I notice it's about the same color as you'd expect it to be coming out, uh, so hopefully it tastes better than it than it looks. Uh, uh, Smell-wise, you get sort of a little cherry, little chocolatey sort of thing you'd expect. Uh, it's supposed to be hoppy. You ever play around uh, with those little cars and some... You know the little engines you can uh, take out and power with a battery? You ever play around with those? You know sometimes it has that sort of smell. Uh, you know, I don't know how else to describe it, but that this is what this smells like, that sort of battery-powered engine smell. <sighs> but anyway, it's not unpleasant, so uh, let's give it a drink, or a taste. <sighs> ah, what is that? Kind of a bourbon-like quality to this. It's uh, a little smoky, actually. Um, very sweet aftertaste, a lot of caramel. Uh, flavorings there. Actually quite tasty, quite good. Let me try it again. Mm. 
And yeah, just a really good balance. I know those guys were making fun of themselves on the cam, but they did a, a really great job here with the balance. Um, just a little hint of bitterness. It doesn't overpower the flavor. You just get some really good sort of caramel, chocolatey, uh, coffee-like uh, uh, flavors going on here. Very tasty, actually. Very uh, refreshing. I'll try it one more time. Yeah, just really good stuff. I mean, it, it might be a little bit bitter for some people, but uh, for me, it's just about right. Um, it's going to be hard to call this one. It's either four or five drinking horns. I, I guess I'm going to go... Uh, I mean, you know, to heck with it. I'll go full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, just really good stuff. I definitely uh, would like to have this one again. It's overrated West Coast style IPA. It's not overrated at all, at least uh, according to yours truly. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And the quotation I found was from Winston Churchill. Always a good source to go to for fun quotes. And this one goes something like this. History will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. See you guys next week. I'd like to see the Spaniard who could make his way past me. Well, you're a Spain, there are millions of them.